Hi there, I'm Candace Matthews Brackeen, and welcome to Women's Tech Week. On today's episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Tamnit Gabru. Um, she's a highly influential figure in the field of artificial intelligence, renowned for her pioneering research in computer vision and the ethical implications of AI technologies. With a PhD in computer science from Stanford University, Dr. Gabru's work has consistently pushed the boundaries of AI, focusing on improving the accuracy of computer vision systems while addressing critical issues such as bias, fairness, and transparency in machine learning models. Dr. Gabru's professional journey includes significant contributions to both academia and industry. She has published extensively in journals, sharing her insights on algorithmic bias, data ethics, and socioeconomic technical challenges of AI systems. Her work has received numerous accolades, underscoring her impact on the field. Beyond her technical achievements, Dr. Gabru is a vocal advocate for ethical AI, emphasizing the need for accountability and equitable practices in AI research and deployment. She's engaged with policymakers, industry leaders, and the broader public, advocating for more responsible and inclusive AI development. Dr. Gabru's dedication to social justice and AI and her commitment to fostering inclusivity and diversity in tech make her a role model and inspirational figure for aspiring scientists and engineers. Her work continues to shape the future of AI, ensuring that technology serves humanity's best interests while addressing its potential risks and challenges. Welcome today, Dr. Tamit Gabru. Thank you for having me. That was not a short bio. That was <laughs> Pretty well, I, you, I feel as if there's a lot more that you've done. And so um, I just wanted to at least share with the world just how wonderful you are. So thanks for joining today. Thank you for having me. So, you know, today, before we get started, I'd like to kind of frame this idea of talking about artificial intelligence, um, because we kick around world, words like AI and machine learning and lots of other words. So I'd like to start by kind of defining some of these things uh, so that we have a proper framing for our conversation. So what actually is artificial intelligence? That's actually a very good question. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna start by saying that um, because um, it's more of a marketing term um, and in my opinion. And um, even when you look at the way um, you know, so it was a term that was used in 1956 by um, like 10 white guys who um, had an application, you know, had an application for a summer um, kind of gathering to solve all of AI. And they used the term AI to exclude some other people who they didn't want to be there. You know, it was a whole kind of political thing. Um, and then what happens is that um, these people were super ambitious in what they thought um, they could achieve. They had words like making, creating thinking machines with their own thoughts and feelings and things like that. And they would um, claim that they actually uh, made those things. So if you look at some of the claims uh, by these people in like 1956 or something like that and compare them to now, you would see comparable hype um, in, in um, mm -hmm. you know, the claims of what AI can achieve. Um, but then what happened is that um, so people get super excited by these claims and pour a lot of money into the space and then get very disappointed because the hype didn't match the reality. And then we would have what are called AI winters, what some people call AI winters. Um, so during the AI summers, um, everybody would kind of want to be associated with the term of AI. So the AI summers are where you have a lot of hype and a lot of money being um thrown into the field, kind of like now. And then during the AI winters, people would get dissociated from AI. They're like, no, I'm not with the AI people. I do more computer vision. So my, my expertise is in computer vision, which is to um, you know, do analysis on, on visual domains, like videos and images, um, and, and kind of try to understand uh, what's going on there. And so you know, I never said I was AI actually, until about 2012, 2013, that term also started to become um, popular. And so then we're all AI now, right? And so we have others who work on natural language processing. So when you look at things like Google Translate, um, translating one language to another, automatic, uh, automatic, automated machine learning, I mean, automated uh, translation systems or uh, um, automa automated um, speech recognition like ASR, 
that could be under natural language processing tools. So those are tools um, that deal with textual data or language in general, like speech. Um, so now those people are also called AI, right? But they weren't, um, you know, especially in the 90s, they would dissociate themselves <laughs> from AI because, again, the field was associated with too much hype. Um, so there's a lot of different sub um, subfields within this space and machine learning um, is also it's it's kind of like a technique. It's one way to um, achieve certain goals. So, for example, uh, I said that I was um, in computer vision. Right. So, you know, let's say you're trying to recognize people's faces or um, or, you know, different kinds of plants or things like that. That field would be called computer vision. But there's different techniques that you can use to do those things. And at some point, machine learning became a technique that was very um, popular within the field of um, computer vision. And machine learning um, kind of, there are so many different um, techniques there, but one of the things that currently a lot of people associate with AI is a subset of machine learning called deep learning, where you um, use a lot of data basically, and it, um, let's say labeled for now. And so if I want to teach a machine how to recognize different kinds of plants, I would first um, have a data set of lots of different kinds of plants uh, annotated by, let's say, the type of plant with each image, right? So I'm, I would have an image uh, of a particular plant, and I would like write out what that plant is, for instance. Um, and then I would use deep learning techniques um, to then quote unquote, teach the machine how to recognize those kinds of plants. So those are all different kinds of terms that mean different things to different people. And now they're all sort of bundled up into AI, right? Um, and then other people have a, a, a different kind of concept of what AI is. Um, and so that could be trying to create some sort of uh, digital machine god, which like, I don't even understand how or why, or that's a whole other story. So, you know, and so the term has resurfaced um, in the last... Uh, I would say um, since 2012, perhaps in the last 10 years. Um, but if you really look at it in the 90s, it wasn't that popular. And you know, so there's ebbs and flows of what we call AI um, summers and winters. So for a long time, for 70 years, it sounds as if this has been an industry, but somehow it's just been in the last, really the last year that all of Americans and really the entire world understands what AI is. I wouldn't say they understand what it is. I would say that they're hearing a lot about it. And so that's another conversation to have is, you know, who is driving the public's um, consciousness about what AI is? So you have a lot of Hollywood Terminator type, you know, movies. Um, you have a lot of big tech companies that stand to profit a lot from, from, certain, from certain practices. So for example, um, I would say in the last couple of years, the reason the public has been, uh, you know, AI has been in the public consciousness is because of chatbots like ChatGPT or other kinds of image generators or like we can bundle all of them into generative AI systems like um, DALI or something. You know, you write a prompt and then, it, you know, you see an image or um, some video or something generated based on that prompt. And um, so what's interesting to me is that we a lot of times talk about these things as if they have their own agency, right? You talk about um, chat GPT as if it's thinking, it's telling you something. It's, you know, we don't think about it as if it's a system that's created by people. It's a product that you're using. Um, and, and that's quite dangerous because that makes us forget that there's actually a company behind this system <laughs> you know, yeah. that's making decisions, right? That is... Um, creating the products in a certain way, that's building the products in a certain way. Um, and so it, it makes it such that we don't think about holding them accountable. We just think about the entity, the, the product they're building like an entity that we should hold accountable rather than the people building the product. Yeah, actually, that's a, a great segue into my next question. So a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, our legislators had quite a few CEOs from big tech companies um, in for a hearing to talk about um, the way that they were kind of affecting our democracy and beyond. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook um, and the CEO of Meta, uh, was there talking. And um, he made the, they made reference to um, some images that had been labeled. Um, and 
those images were labeled as having pornographic material and really child porno pornographic material and images of children potentially um, being assaulted. And, um, you know, there was an option as they kind of showed on the screen this image that, hey, you may have reached um, some, some child pornography here on Instagram. Would you like to look at it or not? Yes or no? Hmm. Um, you know, my, my question for you is, how do those things get labeled? Where does that kind of like information come from? Um, and, and what is, what, what should a company do? What would be best practice as an algorithm or a labeler comes in contact with that type of information? This is a very good question. And I have, I can give such a long answer. I'm going to try no, we're to, here. to wrap we're it up. To learn from you. Yeah. So, um, so we were discussing what AI is, what machine learning is, um, and what you know, deep learning is, and the the way in which many companies are building their products right now is, you know, so I gave the example of teaching a computer how to recognize plants or something like that, and so the and and you need to gather a data set to do that first to train to quote unquote train the machine to do this so now um and and a very you know a like a huge scale way of doing this is that you might gather you might have a data set of billions of images literally like hundreds of millions of images right um and so that that those are the kinds of data sets that we have right now and so um the best practice in my opinion would be when you create a, a, a model, when you create a product to make it task specific, that is to, to uh, make it specific to accomplish a particular task and not pretend that your product can do anything for everyone. And so when you look at some of these products, like uh, Meta had uh, something called Galactica and they the way they advertised it was that you it can create scientific papers, it can create write code, it can um, do something about protein folding and all of that. And my head is like, okay, what like how do you test for all these things? How do you make sure things are safe? How do you you know even um, approach safety? So when you start with that baseline, it's already a lost cause in my opinion. But when you try to make things task specific, first you think, okay. What kind of data set do I need for this particular task, right? If I want the machine to recognize plants, I probably need a data sets of plants and not plants, different kinds of plants, et cetera. Um, and then you limit the number of tasks that can be accomplished. So then that already starts to limit your data set. And then you curate your data set. And this is one thing that people don't do that much of, right? You go through your data set. You, doc, you look at it one by one, you document where it came from, you document what it contains, you wonder, you try to see if this should even be in your data set. Whereas right now, a lot of times what happens with these um, companies is they literally just ingest everything. So speaking of child, um, you know, sexual abuse material, which is illegal to have on your computer in, in this country, right? Um, there was a, a big a data set called the Lion data set that was that powers a lot of these other um, kind of generative AI systems we talk about, like, for example, stable diffusion as one, right? That they just had to take down because a number of researchers found that uh, images containing those things. Um, and now that means that, you know, the group that was assembling this data set did not appropriately curate their data, right? They did not look through every single image one by one to see what, what should be in the data set versus not. And the, the reasons people give you for that is that, well, you need to, big a, to, to build a huge model. A huge model requires a huge data set. And it's really kind of not practical for us to like look at what that huge data set contains. Whereas like, do, do, you, do you excuse anyone else saying something like this? Let's say someone builds food, you know, it's, it's, bring, it's, it's bring, bringing you food to eat. And they're like, yeah. Too many, too many ingredients in your food. Like I, I can't tell you what's in it and what's not in it, right? But that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and to me, there, there is, there are a number of issues. So, so this curation, lack of curation of data sets, means that you are ingesting all the toxicity of the of the web and kind of repackaging it. And we know, as Black women, as women, as wh whatever, all of these these issues that you face on the web, and that's kind of what's being repackaged into these products. The second issue 
is that oftentimes um, the data set labeling itself. So I was giving an example of teaching, you know, a computer how to recognize plants, let's say from an image and human beings might, you know, label, be hired to sit all day, look at a whole bunch of images and say this kind of plant, that kind of plant, that kind of plant. Now imagine for really toxic content, right? Like content moderators, they would ingest these images all day and label them as abusive versus not, et cetera. And so there was just an article recently, <coughs> excuse me, um, from Time Magazine and Wall Street Journal, et cetera, talking about there, how there were the, these Kenyan workers that uh, OpenAI was relying on to um, filter abusive content. So they could, similar to how we're teaching a machine how to recognize plants, they're trying to create a filter, a model to teach, you know, to, to filter out toxic content, which means these humans, right, had to go all day, all day uh, and label this kind of content. And just after a few months, they talked about how some one person talked about how he lost his entire family, uh, his wife, his kids, he's still traumatized, has PTSD, and they were getting paid like less than $1 an hour, right? And so there are so many components to this um, to this question that you asked me, which is why you know, I spend so much time on it. And so there's so many problematic aspects of it. Um, yeah. No, and it's much like a homicide detective or someone who wa works in kind of a special victims unit. Um, they're seeing these things every day, and uh, there's no amount of hazard pay that can remove those things from your mind. Um, so. Can policymakers um, make a difference in this aspect? Because really right now, like humanity and democracy are really in, in crisis. Um, can we even equip um, our legislators with the tools to not only create policy, but also to enforce policy? I, I think so. And I actually think that there are a lot of um, agencies that are already equipped to um, to regulate some of these companies. And so a number of CEOs, um, it, it, it's it's a, a very interesting example um, uh, that that you you gave earlier. But there is another one uh, where um, Sam Altman, you know, was in front of Congress talking about how there is a need for regulation. And again, he's talking about some digital God that doesn't exist so that our minds are over here. You know, we're not thinking about what he's doing. We're thinking about some some, you know, Terminator scenario. And he's telling us that we need to have some sort of international agency similar um, how to how they have it for the atomic bomb. And, mm -hmm. you know, so while we're talking about this hypothetical future scenario, um, the EU had an AI act um, that they were deliberating at the time. And while he was talking to us about how uh, we need to have regulation, he was also threatening the EU that um, OpenAI was going to exit because their regulation at that time was was to um, they were going to overregulate them is what they said, right? And so um, again, you know, they have us talking about something that doesn't exist here. While over here, you know, there is the stealing of data, there is the you know tr exploitation of labor, there's the lack of curation of data, which leads to unsafe products. Um, and so those things don't sound as sexy as AI, right? Like, or a digital God. Um, but but that's really what powers these systems. And so policymakers can make sure that they don't fall for this, you know, conversation keeping us at the digital God level and talk about how companies need to document their data sets. You cannot just sell something saying we don't know what the ingredients are. Um, they need to completely disallow certain kinds of uses of AI that are high risk and unsafe, right? And I think that there are agencies like the FTC that have made it clear that um, these companies are within their jurisdiction. They don't need a new sort of, you know, agency for AI. They can regulate based on, for instance, if there's deceptive practices. I would say advertising your system as if it can do anything for anyone is a deceptive practice, right? And so then once somebody uses your system as as you advertise it and then it's harmful, you should be held liable for that. Um, and I think OpenAI is trying to play this game where Sam Altman and, and um, others will talk about how in the next couple of years, we'll have AI that can be like lawyers and doctors and diagnose you and this and that. But then in their terms of service, they'll say, 
okay, like you're liable for everything, you know, like we're not held liable. On the on the one hand, they're doing deceptive practices, right? Like they're they're um, following deceptive practices, right, of advertising because they're telling you that their systems can do all of these things. But on the other hand, once you listen to them and believe them and, and do exactly that, their terms of service are like, no, we're not held liable for any of these practices. So I think that, you know, what my number one, um, I guess, a message to the legislators will be, don't believe the hype, you know, don't let them regulate themselves, <laughs> right? You know, and so you already are well equipped and, and we have agencies that can, um, that have jurisdiction over these corporations. Absolutely. Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, can we change gears a little bit and talk about what you do today um, at sure. DARE? What What is DARE and um, kind of what was the inspiration? So DARE stands for the Distributed AI Research Institute. It is kind of a mouthful. <laughs> it's like, so that's DARE. And um, I wanted to create a space where you know, I'm a technologist. I kind of forget that sometimes. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. And um, I was, you know, used to be excited about technology and science um, and STEM in general. And I still want to be excited about it and not have to just yell at people telling them not to do things all the time. Right. And so that means I want to have some space to put forward my vision of what the right technolo technological future is, not just kind of yell about the harms um, and tell people not to do something. It's like, what should we do also? Right. And so that's kind of what we do at DARE. We do both those things. We talk about the harms of AI systems when we see them. And we also, when we think that there is a way to use those skills um, to help our communities, we also do that, right? And um, so the first thing for DARE is that it's distributed. And so D is distributed across um, the US, um, North America, I'd say, EU and um, the African continent. And for me, Anything that I do, I want to make sure that it benefits um, the African diaspora, Black people, wherever, right? Um, I want that to be the default. Like, I, I, you know, white men are the default. So you know, I don't think we need to have that in the name of DARE. <laughs> like, you know, I think it just, you know, so the default is that I have to have a, a straight line of, you know, how does this benefit um, our communities? And that doesn't mean only those groups, but I just kind of have to see because they are often the most uh, left out and the most harmed. Um, and so, uh, and then the second, I would say the second philosophy is that um, I think we need to include the perspectives of people who are not necessarily technologists or even researchers um, with an academic kind of credential but have a lot of lived experience in terms of what the harms of these AI systems could be and how they could change. So that would mean, so for instance, we have Adrienne uh, Williams, who used to be a delivery driver at Amazon, and she you know, knows, sees firsthand the way in which workers were algorithmically surveilled and how there was wage theft you know, that was perpetuated with the surveillance. Um, we have Manon, who was a refugee advocate and rescued literally 16,000 refugees from human trafficking, you know, um, and, and so things like this. Right. And so we have Crystal, who's a data who was actually one of those data workers labeling data that we were talking about. And she um, has an organization called Turkopticon that um, works is a data advocacy organization that works to advocate for the rights of data workers. So we have these kinds of people in addition to engineers and other researchers. And so um, the idea is that whatever technology we build, whatever um, way in which we think AI um, should be built has to have these kinds of perspectives um, baked into it as well. But we have this whole technology field that likes to move fast and break things. Um, how do you kind of, can you compromise there? Is there a way to do things for the greater good? Um, how do you kind of rectify those two ideas? Yeah, you know, I think you cannot do good research while moving fast and breaking things. Um, so I'm first, I'm, you know, I was an engineer and I built products on a product cycle and, and things like that. And right now I'm primarily a researcher. And as a researcher, it's kind of like art, right? If someone tells you, I don't know. I think, you know, you can't you can't really think about everything. You can't think through all the issues. You can't think long term if you're just moving fast and breaking things. I also think there is no way to not do harm to communities if you're only thinking about 
moving fast and breaking things. So I love, you know, I don't know if you follow Logic Magazine. Um, I think last uh, the last issue or the issue before that, it was um, titled Move Slow and Heal Things. And I love that uh, idea. Right. And so um, so that's 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 kind of what we're, we're not thinking about moving fast and breaking things. But um, we are thinking about how we can counteract this hegemony that we have um, out of a couple of companies, you know, um, their vision. And when I say their vision, I mean both kind of their philosophy as well as how technically they implement it is to have a one stop shop company model, whatever, for like everybody in the world. You need a doctor, go to OpenAI. You need a lawyer, go to OpenAI. You need a language translation, just go there. It doesn't matter where you live, who you are. That is their vision. Now, I don't think that works technically. And, you know, I just don't think it works. But also, even if it did, I don't want that world. I don't want the world where one of these companies is the one, your one-stop shop solution to everything, and they get all the money. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is trying to figure out, okay, how can we support smaller organizations um, that know their communities well. So let's say if it's language translation, um, automated language translation from language A to language B, um, you know, can we support the organizations that actually are speakers of those languages, the data, the people who supply the data for, for your models, how can we put money back in their hands? How can we make sure that they get hired for these jobs? And so the problem is that sometimes when you have a client um, that let's say once um, a document translated into many different languages or something, they don't want to interface with like 20 companies, right? They, they might just want to interface with one and it's easier for you. But so if we create some sort of federation and an interface where it looks like to you is this one entity, but in the back end, there's many of these um, organizations who don't want to monopolize the world. They're each small and they just want to survive and serve their communities. Then maybe we can help them survive and be a count counteract what's what this hedge of money is you know some of the those are some of the things we're thinking through right and so i don't know if it's gonna work but you know <laughs> but like this is some of the stuff we're prototyping no that makes sense i um i had the opportunity to um sit in the audience as the new president of howard university interviewed sam altman a month or so ago and um like many tech CEOs, he is incredibly charismatic um, and can really move a room. Um, and it's it's a little scary. It's a little scary because he also has this open AI um, API uh, where anyone can build on top of this black box algorithm, right? And you've got people selling lapel pins that'll track you through life. You've got all of these things. Um, you know, he also though runs a nonprofit and you run a nonprofit. I can't believe it. Is that, is that marketing? Like you said before, is that a kind of a marketing? I was thing? just uh, posting about this yesterday. I'm like, you? I was not on your social. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I was like, if Open if Sam Altman can say he's running a nonprofit, California nonprofit law is broken. I was their, their diagram of governance is ridiculous. There is the board that that controls the nonprofit, that controls some other LLC, that has some other LLC, that open it, that Microsoft has, whatever. Then there's that, and then he's talking about seven trillion dollars like that he needs to save humanity. They're raising how much money on a hundred billion plus, um, like, I, I don't even, you know, I, I cannot understand how this company can be called a nonprofit, right? And 100% that is marketing because when OpenAI was announced in 2015, I had written um, this uh, open letter that I didn't send out at the time because <laughs> everybody was like, ah, oh, yeah, everybody's going to know it's you. Like I was like <laughs> an, an, an anonymous open letter. And I was so angry that uh, when they were announced and how the media was treating them, that they were these eight white guys, okay, uh, out of, um, you know, and, and, and two, one white woman, one Asian woman uh, and in San Francisco. I knew a bunch of them, you know, and like these people were going to save humanity from AI. And, you know, and Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, you know, these were the people who were going to save all of us, right? all yeah. the money they pumped into it and that's how it was announced 
And then they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be a cap profit because in order to save humanity, we need the money. But then the money and then, oh, yeah, we're going to also do this. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, that, that was the plan all along. Right. They want to centralize power and, and circle money around, among themselves while telling us that they're saving humanity. We've seen this before. The white men's burden colonized. I mean, like that, like, that's that's kind of it's the same story. Right. Absolutely. And so. I didn't buy it. I never bought it. And, and, you know, we're seeing it, right? Like this is kind of what they're doing. And so, yes. So um, I was, we were talking to our lawyer with a nonprofit, you know, we're thinking about spinning out and she was talking about, you know, the size of the board and what people get scrutinized for. And she gave open as an example. I'm like, look, if we get, if our problem is that we have a hundred million or I don't know, billion dollars, and then we get scrutinized by the number number of people on our board. Like, I'm not even worried about that, right? We have like our little tiny portion of whatever pie, and we're we're still worried about the, the nonprofit rules. And here you are, you, you look at what they're doing and what they're how they're getting away with it. It's it's unbelievable to me. Yeah, it, it's it's really a weird thing to me. So I've got just one quick last question. So um, I, you know, I had a little anxiety about this this uh, conversation today because I am the Brackeen who is not technical. Uh, my husband Brian Brackeen worked in facial recognition, artificial intelligence for many years, and um, so this is like a surgeon's wife showing up to a surgery instead of a surgeon. But um, so my last question is: so I'm married to this AI optimist, and he believes that the future is bright with artificial intelligence. Um, what do you think the future holds for AI? I think it's what people let it. It's it's it's. I the first thing I'll say is it's people who build anything, any technology. So I I don't you know make predictions about AI as if it's its own sort mm -hmm. of entity, right? Like we discussed earlier, there are certain groups of people who make decisions, who build certain products. So if we let organizations like OpenAI dupe us into getting a hundred billion dollars as a nonprofit to save the world, it's not bright. You know, if we let, you know, if we let um, them steal data with labor exploitation, all this stuff, it's not bright. However, if we understand that it's the people who control the, the future of technology, right? And we have the power to decide how to go, right? And, and, and technology should serve us. We shouldn't have to adjust our, the way we live our lives, the way we, we shouldn't have to be made legible to technological systems, right? We, we don't want to change to computers. Like we want computers to adapt to us. So if we do that, I think we're fine, you know, because we need to know that we have the power. Um, and so, but if we don't, then we're not fine, you know, because we're going to, it's the same old story with this, with the new technology, right? We will just let corporations um, centralize power and, um, you know, autonomous warfare and all that, like, but we have the power to not go down that route. Well, Dr. Tamnit Gabru, it is so great to have you. It's been really an honor um, spending this time with you today. Um, is, where can people find you? Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, people can um, follow Dare on a whole bunch of different um, social media platforms. I'm on I'm on Twitter and Mastodon and LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, D Dare is on like you know, the Fediverse, and we're also on like those other channels as well. Um, and that's all I can handle at that at the moment. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. My um, answer might have been no, you will not find me. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, thank you so right. much for this and, and have a great afternoon. Thank you for having me.